start right now. Hi everyone, this is Tim Von Rieden, better known as Von Art Online, and welcome to these Twitch streams that I do every Wednesday at 2 p.m. Central Time. Today, we're going to be talking about what it takes to make it as an artist in the modern industry. And it was sparked by a conversation I had with my CG Cookie former um, co-workers yesterday on a stream that I did for them. Uh, we were critiquing a movie, and it kind of talked about uh, how you need to follow your passion and without it, you're gray and you're in this world where it's monotonous. And I agree with most of what the short, it's called a like, and I, I actually love the short, but I don't think is what's talked enough is just being yourself doesn't make you happy. Like just being yourself and following your passion doesn't like equal happiness. And I want it to be better known that you're always going to have stress in your life. And whether that's from a nine to five that you're working or if you're working independently, like a lot of the friends that I have there, I still see equal levels of stress. The only difference is people that usually follow their passion put the stress that they enjoy putting on themselves where the people that aren't too happy with their job put on stresses on themselves that they don't enjoy doing. So even though I'm an independent artist and have been for about a year now, and I would consider myself very happy, but I am incredibly busy and I think there's somewhat of a stigma to thinking that once you make it as an artist, it becomes easier. And this whole discussion I want to have with you guys today is throughout uh, your career as an artist, it's more of an uphill battle. I feel like it's actually getting harder the more recognition you get or the more established you become because then there's a little bit of pressure that's put on you, not only to do well, but to represent yourself well and then to brand yourself well and then to merchandise yourself well. And there's all these weird things that you didn't even realize were associated with becoming an artist in today's day and age that are put on you. And you kind of pick and choose which stresses, which stresses you want to put on. And I want to emphasize that throughout our conversation and discussion today with you guys that I'm not saying that people that uh, want to leave their job and want to become an independent, like that it, it makes it miserable. I'm incredibly happy, but I'm incredibly busy. And I, I want that to be kind of the overarching theme of today that even successful artists are incredibly busy, more so than usually people that work a nine to five. The difference is they chose to put those stresses on themselves. And um, during the talk yesterday at CG Cookie, my coworker said a quote that I really liked, and it was the idea that you, you need these pressures to chip away at the quality of your core. And he said it's a, re a refinement of fire. You can't make diamonds without intense heat and pressure. And I like that because too often, especially with the new movement nowadays, with the now generation, and even my generation, the millennial generation, it's that instant gratification that need to have something be taught or learned or acquired quickly. And while that can definitely push you in some areas, I feel like it's creating this weird stigma where people don't understand that to really become kind of a quality technical artist, it takes a lot of time and effort. And when people come to my booth nowadays, they'll ask me, you know, what what's your best advice to get good quickly? And then, you know, before I would give my whole speech on about what it takes, blah, blah, blah. But now I kind of respond with a, oh, it's really easy. Just do like a thousand drawings and then you should be much better. And they usually like laugh with me. But in the back of my mind, I'm kind of like, I'm kind of being serious. I don't think it's something that you can learn in a year even. I think you could get really good really in like a year span if you like push it every day you're watching videos and you're producing work on a daily but a lot of it will come in like the long term in terms of your quality and your success so let's have that conversation today i'm going to work on this drawing which essentially is a person putting their hands through fire and they're getting like all charred up their arms but then the hands that come out the other side are cut in fresh like diamonds and uh, we're going to have the fire kind of swarm around him uh, on his arms. So that's kind of what I would want to do today. I did a quick little foundation layer. And I'm going to primarily work with, 
I think a 2B today. Let's see here. Yep. Because I want it to be darker and I really want the charred skin to be apparent. So let me make sure you guys can see this. And when I pull, I took reference photos of myself before the stream just so I could get good shots of like the arms and the pose. I guess the only thing I didn't, I think I'm gonna, I was struggling if I want the palm to be facing more out where you can see it versus um, more straight on. So it was like the difference between this and like this, but I think I'm gonna stick it more straight so it has more of an angular kind of strong uh, pose. Okay. So yeah, so sorry for that long introduction, but let's go ahead and get started. And if you have any comments or questions that you'd like to uh, submit and like join in the discussion that I'll speak live, put at Von Art before it so that way I can see it and uh, it's really easy for me to look up and down from the stream. Actually, I'll move the comments over here. There we go. Um, Fem says, oh, so mysterious. I'm looking forward to that glimpse. Oh, it's it's a sweet one. I'll tell you that, and you'll understand <laughs> uh, why I have to carry it down. So uh, for those of you who don't know how I draw, I usually have a more, it's more traditional, and I was one of those kids that used mechanical almost to like, despite, despite my teacher's uh, warnings that, you know, mechanical... It's dangerous to use those right away, and you should really work with traditional, blah, blah, blah. So I think just to spite them, I worked mechanical for so long. But now that I'm a bit older, I can at least understand why they recommend not having mechanical so early. And it's to kind of learn uh, values. And uh, with mechanical pencil, oftentimes it's preloaded with an HB value scale. And for really you know, getting a range of value, it's so much easier with traditional pencils that come in like a 2H because there's such a difference between like a 2H and then a, a 9B. You know, it's like night and day really. I think I'm gonna not so much wing it, but I'm going to draw a little quicker today. So I think I, I like the idea of this drawing being a bit more unrefined. And then maybe near the end, if I want to refine it a bit more, I can. But at least starting off, I want it to be kind of quick and lay down my base values. But I, I'm going to lay it down light enough where if I needed to erase it, it would be possible. That's something else I'm learning is, you know, not to push down too hard with these B pencils because you never know what you want to commit and what you want to pull back from. You know what? I'm gonna actually turn this, or no, we're good. Um, so yeah, okay, let me see some of the questions here. Oh, and hey, uh, Danny from Houston, hello. Uh, it's not an oil painting, I can tell you that. Oh, I'm glad you came to the stream yesterday, Smack City. Uh, Jamo says, yeah, some people think they can get good just by drawing one thing once, and then they incons they're really inconsistent and can't figure out why they can't draw certain things. That's, that's very true. And in my experience, it's usually people that rely very heavily on reference and that... Uh, and I'm not saying that you shouldn't use reference. I use reference all the time. But it's one of those things where if you want to... Like, for instance, human figures. If you really want to learn the human figures... Draw a lot of human figures. I'm not talking like 10 to 20. I'm talking like hundreds. And the easiest way to knock it out in a little bit quicker manner would be to go to like life drawing sessions. I feel like that's where I learned the most in my college career because I didn't really necessarily have the best education. But the one thing that it's hard not to get good from or like learn a lot of information is from life drawing because you literally have the figure in front of you and it's living, it's breathing, it's alive. And the way that the lights are hitting the body and the way that you can almost see how dimensional the body can be based on these lighting uh, systems in the room, I, I learned so much about that. And I 
quickly realized I did not have a very good understanding of anatomy. And when you're in high school, oftentimes, you know, you think that you're pretty good. But it's usually because no one else in your class is that passionate about art like you are. So it's very easy to stand out as like the one that can draw people well when you're the only one in the class that really kind of cares about whether or not you, know, you want to be pursuing an art career afterwards. So that is a good point, though, that to draw something well, you just get in the habit of drawing it way more than one time. And I'm talking, like, a lot more. So even with animals, I really want to get better at drawing animals, but I can't just assume if my next piece I want to do, like, a dragon or something, that the first dragon that I ever do is going to be amazing. Well, thank you, V Modesto 87 for following. If anything, I should have the opposite viewpoint of, like, hey, the first one will be a, a stepping stone into learning how to do a better dragon in the future. And maybe do, like, a few thumbnails and, you know, pick out my favorite features on different uh, reptiles and amphibians and like mm, Frankenstein them together. But doing some of that research first will really help. So I think it takes a little bit of, uh, I guess, preparation in a way to really get comfortable drawing new subject matter. Let me pull this. I have... Uh, reference of charred skin on this Google uh, search here and on Pinterest. I won't show it because obviously uh, it's a little graphic. So essentially why am I, I'm, I'm, I want the fire to be like this pool that's right under him and he's willingly putting his hands through the fire so that he can become a diamond or his hands can be diamond on the other side. And I think uh, this image was just so prevalent in my head, it's, I couldn't not draw it today on the stream. And I know there's a lot of you out there that can relate to when you have that idea that you just have to draw out. All right, let's see here. Uh, Mile says, is it a sculpture? I I guess it would be considered a sculpture. Um, <laughs> I guess you'll understand when I bring it down why I hesitate to say whether or not it's a sculpture. I don't, I maybe I guess it is considered a sculpture, but not in the way that you're thinking. And you probably won't be able to guess it either. So just stay tuned for that one. But I'm pretty excited to show you what it is. Um, Adrian says, a dragon would be cool. I did that recently with references of lizards and ping pangolins. Did I say that right? It's like I see that word a lot, but I, I don't know if I pronounced it right. Uh, yeah, I would love to do a dragon at some point. And especially to have one at Dragon Con, I feel like it's one of those fun, like, oh, what's this artist take on a dragon? And I guess I've never really drawn dragons, so it would be a fun challenge for me too. And I'm not, even though I know that the arms are going to be really dark, I'm still not pushing the arms super dark because, like I said, I like to have a foundation of value first before I start doing any refinement or detailing. And pushing a, a really dark dark would kind of throw off my entire composition right now for me visually while I'm learning um, how I like the piece as a whole. And I've gotten a lot better over the years at not rushing a composition and kind of building up my value slowly. And that's something that I do think I'm going to continue doing because I've seen how good of a result that can produce when done um, kind of with purpose. Um, art stuff says, got to agree with having to create an idea, but at the same time, you end up with a lot of unfinished stuff. Yes, which is why, like, 
backburning a drawing is the worst thing I think you can do as an artist. And oftentimes you'll find that you, as a creative energy, you're constantly having new ideas flood your brain. So if you're constantly being like, oh, I'll get to it later, and then you backburn it, but then another idea comes along, but you're still not finished with your first drawing, and you're like, oh, I'll backburner this one too, and then eventually you're just going to have all these things that are overcooked on a backburner that are never going to see the light of day. So I've made it kind of a pretty good point in my career doing art that whenever I have an idea that is very fresh and kind of prominent in my mind to get it out right away. Because if I do a thumbnail of it and I just, I'm like, oh, I'll do a thumbnail now and I'll get it out later. Like I would say eight times out of 10, it never actually manifests itself. And now I make it a habit, like I said, to just draw it out right away. So instead of doing the collector part four today, I'm doing this lovely image. <laughs> and I guess it's going to be also a little bit on a fire tutorial, which was, I guess, unexpected, but I'm definitely excited to do kind of these wavy, almost like James Genie type lines here. So let me go ahead and get the, the conversation started then and then like open it up to you guys. Uh, someone was asking me on the stream yesterday, they said, what if everyone was given a base income so that they can at least support themselves to live and to eat, and that way they can follow their passion, and it would be this government-funded program. And it was kind of a hot topic on the, the stream yesterday. And I think a lot of the way I was uh, raised in terms of like how to build a work ethic, I think by giving this base of like, hey, you don't have to work for housing or food, it almost creates a level of um, ease that I think doesn't actually help someone follow their dream. I think having these pressures and these kind of, in some ways, I guess people would call them burdens, but when you know you have to make a certain amount of money to support yourself financially, if there's like goals that you have to work towards, I think there should be like a level of not only risk, but of um, a work that has to go into it. And that, that pressure, I actually think catapults me to work harder. And I think that's where the conversation became more for people that kind of like cringe under pressure and they fall back. I could see why this would be maybe helpful for them but I think for most artists, I think we kind of need that kick in the butt to get going. And I think if you were just given a handout, that it would actually enable people to be lazier rather than to invoke the opposite, which would be to work harder. So something to think about and something I want to talk about then, not on like the political level, but on what does it take to become a stronger artist, which was eventually what the, uh, the conversation became as well. And for me, I believe you really have to learn how to sacrifice things that you love. And the thing that we love the most is time. And it's like, how much of that are you willing to sacrifice for uh, a drawing to just sit, you know, somewhere, whether it be a basement or a family room or somewhere outside or a coffee shop, wherever as you work, how willing are you to give essentially your life to this career path and then you'll have to learn how to sacrifice things like time with friends and then it becomes sometimes time with family and that's where you see a lot of people struggle especially not even in the art world but just in uh, the normal business world it's a really tough kind of uncomfortable conversation to have for a lot of people it's like well what are you working for if for you you want to provide support and care and love for your family but while you're alive you're not even there to see them grow up and to be there for the times that they might need you the most yeah you might be providing them financially but are you there emotionally which arguably is more important in the end so as an artist i am i'm very cautious even about 
where I think I want my kids to go as a career path. And do I want my kids to be artists? I don't know. I think this this industry is very defined by people that are willing to sacrifice most of their time to this. And I'm in a relationship now, and even they always comment how my work, I don't really have a nine to five because it's literally almost all the time that I'm alone. I don't play video games. I don't do things by myself really. And I love watching movies, but if I watch a movie, I'm usually drawing while I'm watching the movie. So you have to kind of be aware that there are a lot of people like me that are willing to sacrifice most of their time. And these are the people you're competing against. It's not your classmates in high school, definitely not your classmates in high school. And I would even argue it's not really your classmates in college either if you go to an art school because then you'll see that there's some that may not take it very seriously. And then unfortunately, they can't get jobs after school and then they become the friends that it's it's just really sad because school debt is a real thing and it's very heavy. It's a really heavy cost to you know, put on your shoulders. And I don't want to see any of you guys fall into that either and I think that's partially why this stream I think I want to be a little more real with you guys in terms of what it takes to be an artist in the modern age now the good news is it is easier to make money because of all the different avenues there are so you have like twitch which you can make money um, you'd really have to be like a dedicated twitch person though like I only do this once a week and to me this is not like my money like to me, it's just fun. I I do this because I, I have fun doing it. But for some people that want to take it more seriously, I mean, they have to be streaming almost every day and have really, like a really dedicated fan base to make the Twitch something more viable. And then you have Patreon, you have Etsy, you have, um, what's the other? Oh, Kickstarters. And then obviously social followings really help if you have like a new book that is coming out or if you have a product that's new, you can push that out. So this is way different than it was even like 30 years ago where the internet was, you know, in its baby stages. And as an artist, you became successful kind of based on your region. You know, like if I was living in Wisconsin back then and if I was, you know, trying to make it, I would probably have to really push myself to be in Milwaukee galleries and try to become a gallery artist to really make it like a fruitful career path because cons even at that time were still growing and even those were still so small at the time and times have really changed in the last even like 10 years the con scene has become very much formatted for artists to make a living from them and you see people like Pete Morbacher with uh, One Fantastic Week and all those people that I've kind of gotten to know pretty well. And they're they're just as psycho as I am about wanting to make this a full-time thing and finding avenues of uh, making money that are outside the typical nine-to-five workplace. And you see that trend becoming more and more prominent. So the competition is just increasingly going higher. Now, that's also not to intimidate you guys that are listening, but also to give you some realistic expectation that it's not a small group of people that are trying to compete in the con world anymore. It's becoming more and more difficult to even lock in spots at cons. And it's something that you may, like five years ago, it'd been really easy to like just jump into cons a lot of the boots were, you know, first come, first serve, but there weren't a lot of people jumping at them. But now the cons that are first come, first serve are incredibly difficult to get into because you have so many artists that are applying at the same time. So instead, I would really challenge you to like buckle down and take it very seriously and push yourself hard because you're competing against people that have been pushing themselves for a couple of years now and you know take on that challenge with a bit of grit and be like you know what I know that for the first maybe year or two I'm not gonna make nearly as much money as these people that I have been doing this for a long time but I'm gonna keep pushing knowing that eventually I can get up to the the ranks and the profit margin that they're making if I can really just push my booth and improve it with each con 
And I think reinvestment is huge. You can't just make a bunch of money in a year doing shows, but then not take the time to like reinvest in your booth, whether that's bigger tablecloths or more poles or better stands or, you know, better business cards, whatever that is. It's like continuing to refine yourself. And even with my booth, I, I'm, I've gotten to a point where I'm somewhat comfortable with how it looks, but even I look at it like, oh, I could be, this could be so much better. And I just want to keep pushing and raising that bar higher and higher. You know, so I think it's a good thing that artists are doing this because then collectively, I feel like the quality and presentation of artists all around will just go higher, especially at conventions. And that will then go into your art because then you want to create better art to match the booth. And it's kind of just this cool back and forth effect. Okay, let me let me see how this looks. Okay, I kind of like where we're going here. All right, let's see here. Data says, what kind of facial expression will this subject have? What expression best describes being forged through fire? Will it hurt? Will it be a metaphorical expression? I want to do a little bit of a smile. Almost like it's burning, but you know the end result will be diamond. So it's like you're pushing through these hard times, but you just know that it'll come out so much better on the other side. And I think I wanted the fire to kind of blind him from being able to see the hands. So that way he knows it will happen. And it's kind of like that weird thing in the art world where like, you know that if you push really hard and you practice every day, you'll get better. But you can't always see it even though it's right in front of you. Sometimes you got to wait a little while before uh, things actually manifest. We'll see though. Um, do, do, do. Um, Michael says, I think it depends on the kind of person. I think some people work hard with a structure in place where some people are still a lot more self-motivating. That's also true. So then you have to take into account the type of personality that you have. Now, the people that I usually see at cons, you can just tell they're very self-motivated. They almost are rebels in a way, especially people like Pete or who else would I say is a rebel in a way? Or even Key, Gawky, my uh, roommate and little sister. It's kind of like defining what you believe will work rather than following someone's expectation of what will work. Or even, I guess, Sean, Art of Price. I think he comes from a tattoo background and... It's new in like the illustrative world to bring that look and that level of um, artistry to more of an illustration uh, world, but it's working because I think it's new and it's different. And you're not just following like the typical stepping stones or look of what fantasy art is. Uh, Hemlock says, I really appreciate your honesty on this. It's definitely scaring me though. Ha <laughs> ha. This isn't meant to scare. I know. I know. I'm, I'll probably talk about the good stuff too, but I wanted, I guess, to start with the, the kind of more real <laughs> aspects. So I guess the positives of all of it, even though I feel like I'm incredibly busy all the time, I'm like enjoying it. Why? Thank you, Aliena Gamer for following so I'm really enjoying it though. Like I love my life. I'm, I couldn't imagine a better life for myself. So whenever I die, I feel like I can die at peace because I know I lived it, you know, the best I could. But that does not mean it's easy. Like this past weekend, I was just literally doing all back end stuff, shipping like 300 international pins. So I had to type out the labels and I had to hire uh, three people to come help me, which bless them. They were incredibly helpful. But then like making the Draltober calendar, which I had to do by myself, and the the merch that we're going to be making for Draltober, I guess I can tell you guys a little insight. We're making like beanies and more pins and eventually sweaters and all this kind of back-end stuff. It's not 
fun for me, but it's like the payoff will be worth it. So it's, uh, someone gave me the analogy of it's like digging for treasure. Yeah, the digging part is kind of hard work. It's strenuous and it's labor intensive physically and maybe possibly mentally. But in the end, you'll get your treasure chest and it will make all that hard work worth it. And that's why I believe you also have to become kind of aware that all the work that you're going to be doing as an artist isn't going to just be fun drawing stuff which I think is definitely a misconception. Uh, I think I, I know a lot of people that think all I do all day is just draw and I like live with a house of artists so we're just partying all the time. <laughs> but it's not like that at all. I just I try to seclude myself a lot of times in the basement or in the front room so I can just focus on drawing or if I'm doing work stuff, I just I really want to be left alone and focus on uh, the task at hand, which oftentimes is like, reordering paper or sleeves or booking a Airbnb for a convention. And then, well, I thank you, Unicorn Attack Force, for following. And then you can get into other really exciting things like collecting receipts for taxes, <laughs> you know? Like, th these are things that are not really talked about. And even, like, in our education system, I feel like why were we never taught how to do our taxes? I feel like this is something that could lead into a different conversation, so I don't know if I necessarily want to go that route. But I think it's good to note that it's something that's very prevalent with all of my friends, especially like the tax scenario. And that can be really mentally taxing, no pun intended. And you kind of have to learn it yourself or you have to go somewhere. And then you have to realize that, yeah, you might be making some good money at cons, but like a fourth of that is going to go back to the government in tax sales. So that's, I guess, another scary part about being an independent artist, but something that I think needs to be talked about. And I want you guys to know that that's something that will you'll have to think about if you want to become an independent artist. I'm going to make this really charred down here. Okay, let me look at Okay, Luva says, I don't make a living out of my art yet, and I'm already sacrificing time. Also, I have a chronic back pain, so the time I'm not drawing is because I'm resting, and that means a very poor social life. At least I do what makes me happy, so I guess you find a reason to make it worth it. Go ahead. Yeah. And... I mean, that's a situation where it can get really tough because social life for me is basically like all my friends are artists. All my close friends are really passionate artists. And I'm realizing that you surround yourself with people that share a commonality of passion and that will push you further. And it's that idea that, you know, you share your, I think, what is it, your five closest friends you kind of share their mentality and their work ethic and for me that's why I think the not only my roommates at Von House but then all these new friends that I'm meeting at all these cons they've been a good influence and uh, a good friendship for me to have because we don't need that every day of hey how's it going how are you doing because we see each other at cons and we already know we already know that we're incredibly busy so we we don't need that day to day hey how's it going and that level of like understanding has been comforting to me in a lot a lot of ways because then I, I don't feel that pressure to text message you know all, my, all these art friends that I'm making of like hey how's it how's your day going and some people could see that as being not like actual good friends but I think the best friends that I keep nowadays I relate to plants and it's the idea of how often do you need to take care and water them. So all my friends nowadays are more like cactuses and uh, succulents. They need to be watered maybe like once a week, maybe. I mean, cactus is like once a month, really. And uh, other plants like cilantro are people that need like that daily affection and care. And I don't really have any cilantro friends in my life. And I used to. And I would try my best to maintain the friendship, but... You, you get to know yourself 
and what you need from other people. And I don't need that daily. I don't need someone to ask me how I'm doing every day. If anything, I want someone to be like, hey, I found this new con that we can go to together and then we can split an Airbnb and then we can hang out at night. Because at night at these shows, like that's when you can really, you know, kind of kick back and enjoy their company because you already understand each other so well. And you understand that their passion is very important to them. And as I think a lot for you guys, it's not that you don't have time for these people that aren't in the art world or aren't passionate, but it's hard for them to understand you. And in a way, it becomes isolating when you surround yourself with a bunch of people that you feel can't understand you as a person and why you're so passionate about things um, that relate to the art world. Okay, let's see. I got to make this fire look like fire here. <laughs> I'm going to do a few, like, almost comical fire strands. We'll see. We'll see if I like this or not. So, yeah. Uh, let's see here. Femme says, this piece kind of reminds me of the song What We Lost in the Fire by Troy Baker. I actually don't know that song. Why, thank you, Seton6, for following. Hey, a girl, Sean, says, hey, looks great so far. Hello, hello. Um, Art Stoff says, out of curiosity, how many clients do you have at one time? Uh, zero. I am a full independent artist, so I'm not a freelance artist. And the only time I really do freelance is, like, for my old boss at CG Cookie because uh, I respect him so much. But if it was just some random person, I would not do the work for him. And... It's just doing like my, or birds for their microbrewery that him and his twin brother own. So I'm not a super fast artist, but like these birds I can usually pump out in like three hours max. And um, I'll do a post on my Instagram at some point when he releases all the microbrews uh, with the labels with the birds on them. Uh, to do. A girl, Sean, says, is there an existing resource that you use that helped you figure out all the financial info you needed to know just for starting with conventions? Anything for you need to know for out of state? I'll be doing my first real cons this year at OluxCon, and I just got into OhioCon. So out of state cons definitely pull a different level of complexity because technically you're supposed to file for state tax at every single state that you show in. Most artists don't, and it's kind of this weird gray zone where I haven't really heard of any artists getting in trouble as long as you do your federal taxes right at the end of the year. Um, but that is a conversation that I'm having with my financial advisor, and even I'm still not 100% clear on it. I will say, though, uh, I have learned that whenever you go to a convention, like let's say you go to Emerald City and it costs like $1,700, including the booth, the flight, the hotel room, food, lift, rides, parking, the baggage fee, uh, whatever it is, all your expenses. And let's say you walk away with like eight grand. Well, as soon as you come home from that convention, put 1700 in a separate account in your bank or whatever you save your money in. And put that 1700 away for next year because I think the biggest thing that we've learned doing all these cons is they're expensive when you're doing like 20 a year because do 20 times, let's say average booth cost is like 400 Already you're looking at like eight grand and that's just on booths, you know? So if you're not putting money aside for it, it's really hard to generate money and have that capital to work with if you're not saving along the way. So as much as I fully believe in reinvesting when you make money, that whole concept of spend a nickel to make a dime, I also think that it's smart to have money set aside that you know can be used for future conventions. And uh, I guess this more speaks to people that want to do conventions, but maybe just in general, um, to have somewhat of a separate account purely for reinvestment into art supplies or 
uh, buying, maybe it's like a new camcorder if you're a Twitch person, uh, things of that nature. So this fire, I really need to make sure reads as fire. So hold on, let me let me take a solid second here. Cause then I also want there to be like this ring of fire. Okay, I think I need to sharpen my pencil too. So whenever I get to a point where my pencil is kind of dull, I'll then rotate it and then work on areas that I know I can block out a bit darker before I sharpen it. That way I can get kind of the bluntness of the tip while it's still blunt and then I feel like I'm not just sharpening every two minutes. It's like being more efficient with the pencils at hand. And I think that's another thing I like about traditional over mechanical. Now mind you, I love both, so I'm not favoring one over the other. But for times where I really want to add a lot of value to a, a piece in a drawing, having traditional helps because then when it becomes more blunt and dull, you have this larger surface area to work with to darken some of these areas. Now, like I said, though, I'm someone that builds up value very slowly. So for me, you're not going to see like a crazy dark being pushed uh, too early. Um, let's see here. This is great. Thank you. Great advice. Um, Fem says, a bit of the lyrics from that song, see the parade fall in line, yeah, look at the diamonds in their eyes, not from the riches, not from their gold, but from all sparkles that they found in the coal. Let them feel the warmth of their newfound desire as they dance through the ashes of what they lost in the fire. Let it burn up to the sky. There's a freedom you cannot deny. I can rebuild bigger and higher. I can replace what we lost in the fire. Oh, I like that. Yeah, in a way, that's kind of what we're working with here. And I think that's why I want his expression not to be so much of pain, but of like that uh, just desire, that passion. And by allowing yourself to, you know, put yourself through the fire. I don't know exactly how I'm going to make the hands look like diamond, but I'm going to do my best. <laughs> I'm going to focus, I guess, today on this stream on the fire. I'll probably finish this drawing today. Um, don't hold me to it, but I'll post it on my Instagram tonight. Uh, usually when I get really excited about a drawing, I need to like finish it quickly. Unless if it's a bigger piece that I know will take me a lot uh, longer. If it's something smaller like this, I usually try to knock it out pretty quickly. If possible, of course. Yeah, so see, it's so blunt though right now. Trying to do little details come way too thick. Oh, hey, Sean. How are you doing? Sean will be away for a couple more weeks. And and he's really excited for Halloween season two. I know we've talked about this before. But October is around the corner. And I guess I should show you guys pictures sometime of my house because I totally decked out the front room. <laughs> I'm kind of a nut, I, I could say. Uh, Artsoft says, well, that's great. Congrats on that. Are you still working on that comic you had? Yes. I'm taking a break until November, though, because I'm putting all my time and focus and energy into Draw-tober, except for today on today's live stream, obviously, because it is a lot of work. Um, I don't think people understand. Sometimes running a challenge that have as many participants as Draw-tober had last year, it's just a lot of like menial tasks that you're you're doing all the time, and it's not just sharing stories. Like that's kind of the fun part of it. It's a lot of back-end answering questions. It's resharing artists on each day. And I, it's, a, it's a, one of those things we were talking about earlier. It's a stress, yes, but it's one that I'm putting on myself. So I'm having fun, but it's still stressful. And I think that's kind of been my one of my new kind of quotes to live by. It's like, I live with the stresses I put on myself and if there's stresses that I don't enjoy or if I don't feel are worth it, 
then I just drop them. If I feel like, I mean, not that this would ever happen, but if I felt like Drawtober was far too stressful for me to handle and it was like not fun for me anymore, I wouldn't do it. But since I love doing it, I don't mind putting that stress in my life. And yeah, at times it can be like overwhelming, but you get through it and you have friends to help keep you motivated. And uh, I think that's why it's good to when you're down to have those people you can turn to if you need them. Uh, do, do, do. Caroline says, one of my college degrees is in accounting. My best advice is document, document, document. Stay organized as you go rather than trying to recreate your accounting at the end of the year. Exactly. I actually have a folder that I keep in the upstairs room that literally just contains all my receipts separated by month. And I could go even further and I should really separate my receipts by month and by the cons that I do. But I'm taking it, I'm learning slowly one step at a time. So eventually I will, I will. But there's a lot when it comes to money handling. But that's great advice. Shartha says, do you know the X-Men's Emma Frost? She has diamond skin. Maybe you can use her as pictures for inspiration. Hey, that's a great idea. Emma Frost. Do ice hands. Does she ever like turn full ice? Maybe I'm not seeing a good reference. I'm seeing a lot of these very sultry white dresses and <laughs> positions. <laughs> um, yeah, if you guys know any like good reference for ice or diamond hands, that'd be great. Um, Shartha says, or sorry, Sean says he'll be back on the 26th. A, hey. actually that's great because Sudi Bear, another friend of ours, is coming on the 28th to hang out for a little bit. Uh, Sammy says, saw the pics on Insta of your decked out room and it looks crazy. I love that pumpkin that makes the fog. I know. And the fog is actually not uh, like a fog machine. It's just water and it like works instantly. I I, I honestly do not know how that thing works. Uh, Pui was over and we were going to like take it apart to just try to figure out how it works. <laughs> I'm sure it's like a mister of some kind, but the the way it does the mist is so good. It's just, it, it's mind boggling a little bit. All right, let me do some more of these swirls. I think another problem, maybe not problem, but something I wanna break with this drawing is having my swirls be too perfect looking. I feel like having it be somewhat kind of irregular would add to that look of it being fire. There we go. So as usual, I'm doing a double ring of, of fire. Well, I guess maybe not as per usual, but I guess for me mentally, when I do a ring, I sometimes don't think just having like one fully captures what I, I like in a kind of more graphic design element. I like having two, unless if it's like a halo of some kind, but in this case, I want two kind of rings of fire here. Nope, I don't like them connecting. And then for the hands, I'll move this up a little bit. I'm gonna stick with the very 
straight, strong, tense hand here. And same for the other side. Oh, by the way, have any of you guys seen American Horror Story? If so, what is your favorite season? I, I've only seen Coven and... Uh, what was the other one? Oh, Freak Show. And I just started season one last night. And I'm trying to figure out which other ones are worth watching and which ones are not. I know... I think me and Keith tried to watch Ron, Roanoke, or however it's pronounced, and we were not crazy about it. So let me know if you definitely think like one's better than the other. Yeah, kind of like these very straight triangular hands. Oh, hello, Mushi. Do you need attention? You know, usually Mushi is like the most uh, unneedy cat, but the past few days, I think since he's gone, she's just been incredibly moody, right, Mush? Yeah. Do you need attention? Yeah, you do. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like Dr. Evil. Did you guys ever watch the old Inspector Gadget where it was like the claw? And it was always just petting a cat. Why thank you, Mimitsu, for following. Um, what's my costume theme for this year for Halloween? The theme for our house party is Halloween. And I guess you'll see what I have cooked up in the back of my head um, later this year. <laughs> That's all I'll say. Let's see. Emma Frost Diamond Head Reference from Noah Wizard. Oh, that's pretty good. Yeah, I can definitely work with that a bit. Uh, season one is really good. Oh, Tommy's got a reference too. Oh, that's interesting. Wow. I know I definitely think I have to work with a lot of these diagonal sharp contrast to kind of create that diamond look. Uh, Gooseberry Pie says, I'm already getting to work on Drawtober and I've decided to do most in grayscale drawings. Uh, it's all new, and I was wondering if you had any starter tips for me. Um, thumbnailing helps, especially if you're going to be doing 31 days of drawing. Um, something that I have a bad habit of doing is, like, underestimating how much time some of these drawings will take. So I always want to do, like, these big, you know, idea drawings. But the year I did draw Halloween was my first time, and that's run by someone else. And that was the first time I ever did a 31-day challenge from start to finish. And it was, some days were just difficult. I, I almost broke down on like day 13. Mushi, what are you doing? <laughs> Cat, what are, <laughs> are you, are you hearing this, you guys? Cat, what are you doing? She's like upside down. Oh, Key's cat's so funny. I love Mushi so much. You're being really weird today, aren't you? Sorry about that. Anyways, uh, Mighton says season one and three are my favorite. Season two has the most horror elements to me and was worth seeing once, but I don't. I wouldn't actually watch it again because of my disturbing... Oh, the disturbing level. Freak Show was my least favorite. Hotel was interesting. I don't think Lady Gaga did that great, but it might have been the character they wrote her. I like the format they used for Roanoke, going with the reality show format and then transitioning into actual reality. That was one thing I did like about Roanoke is how different and they were like willing to experiment. Um, yeah, I loved the concept behind Coven and I felt like they were going so strong, but then at some point it just kind of got a little silly and I'm like, what... Like, no, you have such a good concept. Like, what are you doing? And, like, the they kept, like, killing people, but then bringing them back, but then they would die again. And then some people were, like, dead forever, but I'm like, well, why can't you bring them back? So I feel like they were kind of lost in their own rule set that they were creating. 
which was a little disappointing considering I love everything witches. So what I still think is my favorite season so far is still one that I think had a lot of weak points that could have been uh, polished a bit more. And then Freak Show was just kind of fun. Um, I wouldn't say, I agree with you, I don't think it has the strongest story, but the the environment is kind of everything I'm into. So I think maybe I was willing to overlook some things because the atmosphere was created pretty well, in my opinion. Could be better, but um, still fun. And that opening sequence on Freak Show is like ideal. 10 out of 10. I love it. Okay, I'm going to add a few more of these little pockets here. Okay, I'm going to sharpen the pencil so I can get into a little more of the detailing here. Um, but I will, I'm like, I binged it last night. I think I'm like on episode 8 already of season 1. Uh, just because I was working on my secret that I'm going to show you at the end of the stream. And I, I ended up just taking a lot more time on this thing than I initially thought, but I had a lot of fun, so I didn't even realize that eight episodes had passed. And then, yeah, I'll watch season two, which I hear is a lot of people's favorites. They say it's the most... I haven't heard disturbing yet, but I do hear it's the most... Um, it's not, like, the most colorful one, which I'm okay with, you know. Um, Lufa says, I don't like horror, but I watched season one just because of Jessica Lane. Lange, I think she makes she's like a character I love I know they're they kind of overplay her character type in pretty much every season I've seen her in so far uh but I'm okay with that because I think you see this like aging female antagonist that is kind of it's super strong but they're trying to like keep it together and a lot of the times it's often wrapped in their idea of who they are and how they look and they become more like deranged and almost psychotic because of it. And I think she does such a good job portraying that personality type so well. And I think that's why they portray it over and over and over again. Uh, what is this? Um, Fen is showing, Ooh, that's kind of fun. Not so much. It doesn't give me, like, a diamond, but if it, like, creeped up the hands, I could see that. I mean, I definitely want the area around here to be really charred and almost black. And then, like, some pussy areas where the skin's, like, just starting to peel off and burn through. Sorry if that's kind of a gross description for you guys watching. This cat is so weird today. What are you doing? What are you doing? <laughs> I don't know what's gotten into Mushi today. Uh, Mighton says, agreed about dieting and coming back and dieting, etc. And even some witches are dying, not dieting. <laughs> and even some witches that died are back in the trailer for the new season. I know, that's what I saw. And it starts tonight. So like I was going to binge the, the remainder of the first season so that I'm kind of like caught up for uh, season eight tonight. I don't know. I don't know what... I, yeah, I don't know. I don't have the highest expectations, but I'm going in with an open mind. I'll say that. And Mighton says, uh, Jessica Lange even got to play that character archetype in Feud as Joan Crawford. Mm-hmm. And she did a great job. Oh, I'm glad you watched that. I liked Feud. I mean, I, I really like uh, Betty Davis, and I think the movies that she's in, she does, like, an excellent job. If any of you are interested in like wanting to watch an older movie, but you're scared that it'll be a waste of time or you don't know which one to watch because there's so many. And so I know sometimes for a lot of people, sitting through a black and white movie can be kind of tough. But All About Eve, I can highly recommend. I think it's just like a solid written movie. So even if like you're not visually captivated, the story will and the acting alone will help as well. But it's something that we can relate to as artists. Because essentially it's like someone that's made it and then someone that's like a newcomer 
their worlds collide. And then you kind of see like a lot of ugly truth about people that are trying to make it in the world. And then you see the opposite of like how someone that's successful can break down in their own regard. And it's an ugly truth on that end too. So it's like seeing both sides of the spectrum in the same movie. And I think Betty Davis did a great job. Uh, Tommy says, what are your other horror shows or movies that you like to watch at this time of the year? I do have a list of movies I watch for sure every year. I like to watch the Scream series every year. I just think they're comical. Um, <laughs> this year, though, I'm going to watch all of the classic anthologies. So I'm talking like Friday the 13th, Nightmare on Elm Street, Halloween, all of them. And I'm just going to be plopped in my family room essentially most of October. I already told most of my friends I can't hang out in October. Uh, like It's like, don't plan anything if you want me to be there because I, I will not be there. <laughs> uh, what were the... I mean, I try to watch new horror movies every year and I've seen some good ones. And I feel like horror gets a really bad rep and probably actually fair. Uh, I think there's a lot of bad horror movies out there. But I've been seeing, I think last year I saw It Follows, Good Night Mommy. Um, I thought Baba Duke was pretty good too. What was another like kind of psychological thriller? Oh, The Strange Color of Your Body's Tears. That was a trip. Um, I guess I really like psychological horror over actual horror. But if you're going to give me horror, give me just like raunchy campy like freddy versus jason like scary movie three like something that's just kind of fun um that you don't really have to pay attention to it just it's kind of like those movies that you would consider to be guilty pleasures um those are the ones that i usually pull out for halloween so then like uh, for halloweeny movies you know halloween town then um the little vampire there's definitely ones I watch each year that I know may not be like the best movies, but uh, I, I still enjoy them. Oh, and then obviously the classics, Hocus Pocus, Casper, Beetlejuice. You know, I have a list or I just have all the DVDs of those that I definitely keep out on my TV stand and I'll watch those every year. Oh, Paranorman. I actually think Paranorman is excellent. I think it's like his best movie in my opinion. I think from start to finish, it's the most complete as a story and that one I watch at least once every October and the music's just really good I, I don't know that movie I, I think is excellent oh and then uh, for any of those who are into like new movies I want to watch uh, Funny Games USA um, The Lure L-U-R-E, the one where it's like mermaids and cabaret and they kill people. So that's like a horror movie that is super weird and interesting. And I'm like, yeah, like sign me up for weird, super unique, interesting concept movies that are horror. That just happen to be horror, you know? Um, I know I have like a list on my whiteboard upstairs that I've been writing on. Oh, uh, Terrifier, uh, the one with that black and white clown that's been gaining a lot of popularity. I even saw it on Netflix yesterday. I was like, oh, wow, like that really got popular. And I know that it kind of has like a prequel that was in a um, a collection of director movies that I've never seen either. I think it's called, I don't think it's XX maybe or VHS. No, I don't think it's VHS. I forgot what it was called. But that same clown um, got popular in this like, short film and then it, he got his own feature length film so i'm excited to watch that movie uh did i ever get to see annihilation that was a great movie from hemlock uh yes that is my favorite movie of the year so far i thought it was bold and since i didn't know anything about it beforehand i didn't even watch the trailer i knew the director and i was like okay i enjoyed my experience with ex machina i'm just gonna not watch the trailer and i want to go in blind and that has been the best thing to do for movies. If you guys love movies, don't watch the trailers of the movies that you love or that you think you're going to love because it just made the experience so much more surreal and I didn't know where it was going at any point. 
there were no like images that I was waiting to appear on the silver screen because I saw it in the trailer. You know, I think that's a big problem with trailers is like if you see a certain explosion or like a villain that's all bloody with like a gun, you wait for that moment and you know it's coming. But if you don't know anything, then you're I feel like you're just more engaged and then the shock value can be higher and the level of surprise and uh, for me, it's just more enjoyable as an experience. So Annihilation, yes. Excellent movie. Highly recommend. Uh, and don't watch the trailers. <laughs> um, Eliana Gamer says, The Witch is the best horror movie. Real talk. I love the... Well, I joke with my roommates that I call it The Vitch because it's two Vs instead of a W. I love it. I think it's my favorite depiction of a witch in any movie. And you barely even see her. But I love it. I love, love, love. Um, it's a slow movie, so for those of you who don't want to sit through a slow movie, like I can respect that, but I'm warning you ahead of time, it's definitely slower. So you got to kind of like strap in for the ride. But there is a scene, and I'm not going to spoil it, but I'll just say you'll know it because you, for a brief second, see a witch rubbing something on herself, and that visual has stuck with me and it's so permanently ingrained in like how disturbingly creepy yet interesting and disturbing the depiction of this witch is and I think it's excellent highly recommend uh, do, do, do. the little vampire is amazing 10 out of 10 I agree 10 out of 10 <laughs> it's so silly Um, alt mage says so rocky horror picture so style horror yeah i love rocky picture horror uh Ro rocky horror picture show i remember seeing it for the first time in high school after like hearing it was a cult film and i i wanted to be more of like a movie buff so i was like okay i'll watch all like the culty films the ones that have like a big following behind them because of how weird and unique they are thank you soul bad guide 0408 for following and the first time I watched it, I was like, what the hell am I watching? Because I like I brought my friend over and I was like, yeah, this is like a Halloween movie. That's what I thought at the time. I was like, this is a Halloween movie that's really, you know, quiche and fun. And it's supposed to be amazing. And we watch it and we're like, what the hell are we watching? And I'm like, I am sorry that I recommended this. But then as I got older and I went through college and I started to have like this deeper understanding and appreciation of what makes a movie in my opinion, great, you start to realize Rocky Horror Picture Show is amazing. And it's so unique and iconic that it has spun off kind of like cult or a pop culture, um, what would that be called? References. And any movie that is so unique that its characters, its sets, or its songs, or whatever about it, its genre-breaking um, style. It's a film that should be recognized because it pushed film further than it was before. And I think Rocky Horror did that. So whether or not you like it or not, that's it, fine. I think it's a matter of taste in a lot of ways. But you can at least appreciate that what they did was so inventive at that time and different and bold that they propelled cinema in a lot of ways into a new direction so yes i like uh rocky horror picture show and i hope the lure lore i can't even say it the lure uh is just as campy and silly and um bold and new and fresh i feel like i'm de describing like uh a kitchen uh meal it's bold new fresh flavors organic <sighs> fair trade Okay. Uh, to do. Owen says, have you seen The Collector? It's a strange horror movie as well as nail biting. Oh, and the clown from Terrifier was in two of the other movies called All Hallows Eve. Thank you. I was like, I, I know it's not XX or VHS. Um, is it good? Was All Hallows Eve worth watching if any of you have seen it? And I've heard of The Collector. I've never seen The Collector movies. Um, I guess I should give them a try though if you recommend them. I'm literally down for watching any movies you guys recommend for that are horror for this month of Drawtober. Because I'm literally just going to be in my family room all day and 
watching new movies can be inspiring and it's fun, especially if like a roommate joins me that day or whatever. So I'm totally in. So if you have movies to recommend, I'll write them down on my end. So I'll put the collector. All Hallows Eve. All right, let me look at more scarred flesh here. Um, Ferris Moss says shakes head I definitely prefer horror and things that actually scares me not just jump scares and stuff I don't like the campy ones I prefer the stuff that really gets me and plays off my own fears games usually do a lot better than movies it's it's an interesting thing because like I am definitely someone I mean a lot of my friends consider me someone that has like obnoxiously high taste level when it comes to film like I love The Fall if you've ever seen The Fall um Synecdoche New York is like a big mind thinker but in terms of like psychological thriller I love Rosemary's Baby until the very end where they kind of reveal one way or the other is she crazy but I always love movies that play on your psych that are like Mother I thought was excellent I don't I don't think it was a horror movie but I would say it was a thriller, 100%. Black Swan, same vein. Uh, what would I say are movies that, like, genuinely... Oh, The Shining, I think, is an awesome horror movie. But that one could also be considered more of a psychological thriller. So for me, I like psychological thrillers. And I think horrors are just... I can't take them seriously. Especially, like, the Saw sequels or, uh, like, <laughs> like, Freddy vs. Jason, to me, is so camp that they become comedies and i don't know about you guys but there are like horror movies that i just cannot take seriously because they don't take themselves seriously or their characters are so dumb that you're like i i don't believe that someone could be written this dumb like i know people make poor decisions from time to time but i can't believe that someone can be written to be this dumb um i think the best movie example of being like just really dumb is amusement if any of you guys have seen that movie, uh, my favorite film reviewer, uh, Adam Johnston, or Johnson on YouTube, his channel is Your Movie Sucks, or YMS, and he does a three-part series, or a two- or three-part series on amusement, and it's so funny. I would definitely recommend that um, review if you kind of like people pointing out why movies are so bad. And that to me is like a good example of like a horror movie that just, <laughs> it thinks it's trying to be serious, but it's just so bad. Um, another example, and I might get some people that might be angry with me on this one. Um, Tusk, I still think is perhaps the worst movie I've ever seen. Uh, I think it's horrible and that's supposed to be considered a horror movie. I thought Human Centipede was better than Tusk, honestly. <laughs> Uh, Owen says, All Hallows Eve spooked me for a few days straight, but it's a good film, though. Oh. Um, Hemlock says, Not a movie, but The Ritual from Netflix is a good watch. I love the creature in The Ritual. I Yeah, I thought as a movie it was kind of whatever, but the creature design I thought was excellent. So anytime you had the creature in shot, I was like, sign me up for this. I am 100% in. Um, Sweet Pea says, what about House Last House on the Left? Is that the one with Jennifer Lawrence? I believe I... That's the one I did see, unless if you're talking about a different movie. Um, Ferris... Ooh, well, thank you, Danica Sills, for following. Uh, Ferris Moss says, I love horror games like Dead Space, and especially... Cry of Fear. Cry of Fear is one of my absolute favorites. I've never played Cry of Fear, but I did play and beat Dead Space, even though I am horrible with horror games. Um, I was doing it to impress someone at the time, and it was scaring the hell. I was sweating. 
I was sweating playing this game. And it was not an enjoyable experience for me, but I was really glad I got through it. And I guess in a way I feel I felt more confident about like, okay, if I can do Dead Space, I can I could do other horror games, but I haven't really touched one since. <laughs> I don't know if Dead Space was like my one and only, one and done type deal. Like, okay, I did that horror game, so now I don't have to play a horror game ever again. But I love watching people play horror games. It's like right now I'm in a relationship and they love playing horror games. So for me, I I can just sit on the couch and they can just play the horror game and I feel like I can still experience it. Uh... Tommy says, has anyone seen Maniac with Elijah Wood? I couldn't bring myself to continue watching it. it. was I was too disturbed. I've never seen it. I've actually heard of it. Why, thank you, Draskia, for following. But I've never seen it. I mean, that movie kind of was so indie. It reminded me of, what was the one with Daniel Radcliffe? Horns. I actually like Horns. Uh, I know a lot of people didn't like how the ending went, but I actually didn't mind it at all. I thought it kind of continued where the weirdness of the story was going anyways. So I don't know. It didn't really bother me that, well, I'm not going to spoil it, but just know there's kind of an end part that either you like it or you don't. Uh, Fem says, Tab... Bula Rasa is a very good watch on Netflix. Not horror, but kind of dark and suspenseful. I will write that one down. Tabula Rasa. Uh, Aliena Gamer says, The first paranormal activity was good. I agree. And I watched that one in the theaters when it first came out. And I don't know if you guys remember this. They were so good at their campaigning, or their marketing campaign for their closing outro uh, when they like list all the people that work on it for this movie, they didn't, it just kind of like ended. And then it had like one slide up that was like, uh, and they were never found again or whatever it was. And then it just kind of went to black and it was like, what, like, what was that? And I saw it before they did the alternative ending. So I saw the more, uh, real practical effect one, not the digital effect one. And it was scary. Uh, I went back, to, I remember going back to my hotel room or my, uh, where was I at the time? No, I was at my dorms in college still. And me and my roommate were just terrified. And it was hard for me to sleep that night. But it's, you, you like let fear overcome you, you know, like that's kind of the job of the horror movies. So the ones that do it well, kind of make you second guess things that go bump in the night, you know? to do alt mage says be the navigator helper in games best time to draw i agree uh, michael says i haven't watched too many horror movies but i think this might this might but i think i might this halloween to get into the draw tober mood mood absolutely that i mean that's partially the reason i watch horror movies only in october so i can get into that mindset and a lot of the drawings I have for Drawtober are not very nice looking. A little more on the creepy side. And I'm so excited to share that with you guys. Do -do -do. Sweet Peas, that's funny because that was my first horror game too. I started playing Dead by Daylight recently and to me it's more anxiety inducing than scary. Yeah, I think a lot of uh, games do that nowadays too, which is kind of fun. Um, I was watching uh, Josh play, what was that game called? Remothered. And it's a really short indie horror game, but uh, there was a good jump in there where I was like, oh, like that definitely got me. kind of deciding if I want the fire to have any of these like little tail offs or not. I don't know yet. Cause if I do, it might look too much like smoke. Like I do, I still have to make it look like fire. So I need to have like more of these like pointy 
Let's see here. Oh, no, I hate that. Oh, no. I can do better than that. Come on, Tim. Oh, I don't know if I like that either. Why, well, thank you for whoever just followed. I missed it. I'm sorry. Um, hold on. I'm going to rework some areas here. Because I think to give it more of like a fire element, I need to have a few more points. Which, admittedly, I'm not used to doing. I'm so used to doing like curvy stuff. Oh no, I hate that. Oh no. This, oh, this might be like my first struggle. It's like, how do I wanna draw fire? And I like the way that I drew it on Blind Rage, but you can see how it's all very swirly, swoopy. And it's not giving me too much of a fire effect at the moment on this one. It's, I feel like I almost have to commit to bigger points let's see if I can do some bigger points here Ugh. oh I'm gonna struggle with this guys Um, Alt Mage says, Alan Wake was an interesting concept for a horror game. Had to use a flashlight and was more of a psychological thriller game. It's been out for a while and probably cheap now. Oh, you know what? I'll make him play that one too. I want uh, Josh to play Bioshock 2 because he played Bioshock 1 last year and that was awesome to draw in the background too because the atmosphere is just so good. It's so good. But I can barely remember Bioshock 2 even though I played and beat it. But I feel like it's been so long that I can barely remember uh, it very well. So that was another game, I think. Did a good job at like bending genres because it's classified as a horror game, but to me, I think it's beautiful. I, I don't think it should just be considered a horror game. Uh, doo -doo -doo. Oops. Wait, let me grab... I'm going to look up Reference of Fire. How does James Jean do his? Let's see. Do, I want to take inspiration from a few people here. Oh, his kind of looks like a watery flame, which I guess I kind of am into. This is probably something I'll do after the stream's over. So maybe while I'm live, I'll focus more on the areas I, I can finish. So I'll do maybe like the charred skin and stuff. Because I don't hate it. I, don't, I feel like I'm not like hating it, but let's maybe even do the head a bit more while I answer these questions here. Uh, Lady Coyote says, when I hurry arrived at home from my class college because I want to watch an on a Tim's Twitch live stream, but I was a little late and missed it. No, you're here. Like you didn't miss it. Uh, Gooseberry Pie says, I was wondering if you had any starter tips for beginners um, grayscale drawing. I'm planning on doing Draw Tober in that style of drawing. Thanks. I, I think my biggest piece of advice would be to focus on contrast. Uh, it's kind of our greatest element to work with as a graphite artist. And it can help direct the eye to where you want it to because we do not have the elements of hue and saturation to work with. 
So we only have value. So like take advantage of what you have to work with. Oh, and obviously I'm kind of lighting this as if the light source was the fire. So that's why we kind of have this overarching shadow on the head. I guess something I will do live on the stream is I'll pull out a 9B and I'll darken the arm so you can kind of see the process of how to go about doing that. Um, Them says maybe some little flames coming out of the big pool of flames, like pieces of skin are a flame and flying around a bit, I guess. Yeah, I definitely need to do that. And it worries me that... You know what? Why don't I just look at pictures of real fire? And then I guess I can just like pull inspiration from it and try to create my own look and feel actually this is already way better but yeah I agree I need like more floating pieces around this is a good example of like I I don't draw fire actually really ever so this is kind of new to me and I don't want to just draw someone else's interpretation of fire I want to kind of find my own voice within fire. But since this is new to me, like it'll take a couple times to kind of figure out how, what look of fire do I like. I think you demos the knees for following. There's definitely like a lot of interlacing in real fire because it's not solid, it's transparent in a way and it creates all these like cool effects. But I don't want my fire just to look plainly like real fire, you know? Maybe like more crossover in the middle, maybe? It's funny when I do these type of streams where I go in and I'm not really sure how I want to execute it. So then I feel like you guys get to see me struggle in a way, but it's good. I think it's another thing kind of on the topic that we originally started the stream on, on how it's a struggle just to be an artist and even when you get somewhat established there's this weird pressure that people think that everything you touch like it just it it's perfect from start to finish and that's never the case with any of the artists I've gotten to know actually I mean you see people edit and change and they get frustrated along the way it's just that their level of decision making has gone higher so even though they're better at handling the problem solving aspects of like how do I make this look better they still get those problems that, you know, you get when you're a younger artist, too. Uh, Aliena Gamer says, do you know Aaron Honky or Horky? He did a poster for The Witch, Amazing Art. Um, I actually do know. I know the artist, but I don't think I've seen his interpretation. Let's see here. Witch. Ooh. Oh yeah, that's lovely. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I love it. Um, hey, thanks. 
to pig tart said you have great streams thank you before you said fire i thought the figure is in the ocean and the water is taking over his spirit oh that's cool that's an interesting interpretation um i guess i see that's a problem though because if i really wanted to read as fire i i think i'm dancing with too many swirly elements and not enough irregularity to the fire Let me see. Let me look at fire again. Why, thank you, Pedro Soul, for following. You know what? This is actually a good time for me to pull out the 2H. There's certain pencils that I just feel comfortable when doing certain areas. So like to build up like a slow gradient transition, I like pulling out the, the 2B. Yeah, it's tough. You know, fire is something that it's such a crazy wild element that to capture it in like a still image without it just being like a direct, hey, this is fire. I'm not going to really try to spin it in any way. It's kind of difficult. But I, I like the challenge though. So I'm kind of like, okay, Tim, like let's let's figure out how we can really make this thing shine. So right now it's still kind of swoopy, swirly. It's not really reading fire as much. Oh, I should look up like a ring of fire, like hula hoop fire. Ring of fire. Uh, that got me something totally different. <laughs> Hula hoop on fire. Huh. One, well, essentially it's also weird because you're kind of playing with the element of light. I mean, fire, it's not like this like gradient of color so much as like a property that emits light and in a lot of ways it's just kind of white in the pure form like it's so bright but then as it the surrounding area emits kind of an orange hue because of the wavelength of light so it's it's weird I feel like I should be focusing less on like filling in the darker values within here and more on pushing the areas around it to be darker so that the contrast really adds to it but the ring of fire that I'm looking at definitely has some cool things going on. It's like this needs to go. This is another good example of like me possibly not looking down as much 
and like focusing when I look at my reference, kind of just focusing on the shape quality and the madness of irreg irregularity that I can create because I'm not looking at my drawing. I'm looking at the fire in front of me, the reference image here. And I definitely know that my fire gets misinterpreted a lot because my line that I did for last year's Drilltober, people were like, oh, I love that his mane's on fire. And I was like, ugh. Like, no, that's just kind of how I draw fur. But if that's how you see it, awesome. <laughs> but definitely not the intention. So I think drawing fire really stylized, or drawing like fur really stylized can get misinterpreted. But I think same with fire. I think the more you stylize it, the more it can look like water. Which usually I'm okay with. I don't know why it's it's kind of bugging me with this drawing. Or like I don't want it to read so much as fire. Or I don't want it to read so much as water, sorry. You can always tell when I'm concentrating because I know I get quiet. Why, thank you, cringe captain one for following. Uh, Them says, I think the watery aspect comes from the circle shape it is on the bottom. I know, and I do want to keep that, though. So I guess maybe I'll just have to swallow it and be like, yeah, I get Tim if you want that decision. It, you can't help that it's going to look a little bit like water on the bottom, which I'm okay with. But I do want to look like it's surrounding his arm a bit more, too. Thank you, Mini Shell, for following. Um, Caroline says, doesn't fire usually go mostly straight up unless it is going out and around an obstacle? Maybe that's why it was mostly looking like water. Yeah, I think you're right. And I wanted to create this like effect of him. You can see like in my thumbnail. Well, I guess even my thumbnail, it's more straight up. Maybe I can fix that then. Let's see here. It's almost like the top needs to be not the most defined, but the most shaped. Let me pull up my 2H again. Maybe a little more loose and sloppy with my line work for a second. I often find that's what will kind of help break up this too perfect looking fire. Because 
even like some of the lines I got over here. Yeah, they're really nice and clean, but that's not helping me. <laughs> Let's see, I can get another good shot of fire. So I think my original concept was also to have the fire be almost more simple. But of course, since I'm always extra for no reason, I don't know why I do this to myself. Uh, it's looking a little more complicated, <laughs> which is okay. It's just funny that I always tend to do this to myself. Where I like go into a drawing and like, oh, we're gonna keep it simple in this area. Nope. So even like this line's way too perfect and watery. Um, Fem says you could just add more irregularities to the hoop or make it closer to the person said being so wide. Maybe it would be nice to make the flames also come down the hands, but also whirling around them instead of hurting the hands, just throwing ideas though. Well, maybe like it like pushed through. Let's see if I like how that looks. Oh yeah, I kind of like that. I kind of like that. Uh, Luva says, maybe it looks like water because of the many swirls. Water has a lot of values inside each shape, but fire is more straight and there is so much light that you can't really see those swirls inside par of the flame. The heart of the fire should be the pure whiteness. I know I really should make like this area white. And that was like my intention. That's why this is so funny that I keep like over detailing it because originally the fire was going to be white in the middle. So yeah, maybe... This is a good time for me to be like, you know what? Pull back. You don't need to add all this detail for no reason. Maybe I'll do just a light gray value around the fire to make it even look brighter. Oop, not there. Hold on. Because like I said, I don't want it to look like pure fire. But maybe, you know what, let's actually see what it looks like without the second ring. Maybe that ring is bothering me. Maybe I do like it with just one. Yeah, maybe you guys were definitely right on that.
Or should I just make the hands like pure white? No, I do. I maybe I do want them to be more glass diamond looking. How much time do we have? Oh, we only have five minutes. Okay, let me get some strong, or let me get some questions here and then I'll show uh, the, the secret I have that I finished last night for one of the days of Draloween. Um, Yulia Flair says, so about being a strong artist, did you have any doubts about pursuing art as a career? And does what does motivate you keep going despite all the, the straggles, straggles? Um, I never doubted that I was gonna be an artist. I think even as a kid, I don't know if it's because I grew up naive being a Wisconsin boy and, you know, having parents that were just very supportive and, um, but not supportive in the way of what I guess most people would think. Like they didn't put my art on the fridge. I wasn't like given free art supplies, uh, from my parents. I would always go to my dad's room, take computer paper. I would take like three sheets of computer paper and then grab one of my mom's um, pencils, which were always themed based on the month it was because she was a preschool teacher. So like a spring, it would be like a flower pencil. Halloween, it would be a pumpkin pencil. Anyways, and I would just draw in the basement for hours. And they never discouraged me. So I guess they might not have been the most supportive in the sense of like, oh yeah, like let's get you new sketchbooks and like let's get you really nice pencils. They were more supportive in the fact by not turning me away from it which I think a lot of parents get so nervous when their kids want to do art. And I appreciate that they never did that with me. Anyways, me as a kid then, never getting outside influence from parent figures or anyone else to tell me not to do it, I was always like, that's what I'm going to do. And I think people always saw me as like being a, the best drawer in the class since I'd started early and no one was really into art anyway. So being kind of like labeled as the art kid early on, I think that label attaches to you. And from that point forward, you are the art kid. You know, you are the one that is supposed to do well in art because uh, everyone else has their own careers, like a, a basketball or a lawyer or accountant. You know, they, they kind of already have other things picked for them and they're going to do the best version of that that they can be. So I had to be the best version of the artist that I could be. So anyways... Uh, how do I keep going despite all the straggles? I need drawing to survive. I don't think I'd want to live if I couldn't draw. It's like my way of communicating with the outside world and in a way being understood by it. And I think a lot of us see drawing as more than just a little hobby that we do on the side. It's literally our outlet to be heard to be expressed and so even though I get frustrated sometimes with the back end of like the business stuff of uh, art <laughs> uh, it doesn't detract me from wanting to continue doing this for the rest of my life and I feel like you'll just know you'll know if you're an artist if you know you 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 do all the crappy parts like all the financing stuff or signing up for cons or setting up a Patreon or getting your Twitch all going, whatever it might be. And if you just genuinely love the process of creation through whatever medium that you choose to use, then you know you're an artist and that's what you should stick to do, to continue doing. So yeah. Um, Adrian says, I like the swirly shapes. I, I, I want a mixture of both. So we'll see what we can make out here. Uh, Femme says, kind of like putting your hands in liquid nitrogen. Oh boy, I'm like kind of nervous to see. Oh, someone actually put their hand in liquid nitrogen. Oh, 
Oh, that's scary. I don't know if I don't know if I like that. That's really scary. Uh, Hemlock says, "Just curious, were any of your ancestors artists? Often it runs in the family." Nope. Actually, my parents are the opposite of artistic. <laughs> so I don't know. Maybe it skipped a generation. Maybe one of my grandparents were artistic, and I didn't even know about it. Um, Fem says maybe something like this. Closer, but imagine if like the hands themselves were made out of diamonds. Like it wasn't just like covering the outside surface. Um, okay, I'm gonna go and grab the secret so you can see it before I cut the stream off. So stay here for just a second. Oof. All right, I'm gonna give you a little snippet of it. All right, ready? All right, I think that's all I'm gonna show you. I'll do it one more time in case you missed it. I'll do maybe like a different area. All right, that's all I'm going to show you. <laughs> um, just stay tuned for Drawtober. I have a lot of surprises that I'm doing this year, so stay tuned for that. Okay, thank you. Is it edible? I'm just going to do a wink. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, everyone, for coming to this live stream. I do these every Wednesdays at 2 p.m. Central Time, and today was fun. I'm probably going to post this drawing on my Instagram later tonight if I can finish it. If I can figure out how to do the fire correctly. So thank you guys so much. And hopefully we'll see you next week. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Drawtober starts in like two and a half, three weeks. And it's a 31 day drawing challenge in any medium that you want to use. The calendar is on Instagram on, under Drawtober. And I will be doing all 31 days. And I'm so excited to share it with you guys. So hopefully you find some interest as well. And hopefully we'll see you next week. Okay. Bye, everyone. Bye, bye, bye. Um, bye, bye, bye. Okay. I lost my OBS. Oh, there it is. Okay. Bye, everyone. Bye, 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 bye.